thank everybody for coming out tonight so we can share our story about the two Waverleys. Our book came to be from doing some family research here at the History Center on my double great grandparents, uh, Andrew Dorfler, and uh, talking to Betty Dirks about that and got talking about Old Waverly. I mentioned the fact that our homestead where we live was originally purchased by J.K. Cullen, who was a big, large figure in starting the town of Waverly. And uh, uh, she said, well, that's good to know that. Maybe you guys should do a book on Waverly. To see what kind of you, what you can turn up. So we started that about three and a half years ago, and uh, no one place was there a lot of information. It was very fragmented. We just kept working and pulling it together, and this this is the result. Uh, we, as you can see, the one on the left there is the history center here. We did research there, and then the one on the right. It's the county recorder's office. We dug up a lot of information on what we call Pioneer Waverly or the first Waverly. And a lot of people call it Waverly Mills, but I'll get into that just a little bit later. Uh, the original land survey was done June 10th, 1855 by John Ryan, deputy surveyor and a six-man crew, which consisted of a compass man, two chain men, an acre man, and two witnesses. And uh, in his field notes, he said this area was well watered and had uh, good, rich, tim rich soil, fine timber, at elm, basswood, ash, maple, oak, and butternut. And uh, the 12 Mile Creek uh, provided a good water power because Little Waverly Lake really didn't exist the size that it is today. Uh, so with the dam, they could have a big reservoir, which made it far more advantageous than like the Crow River because it runs fairly fast and it would take a sizable dam to make any kind of reservoir, that this would be a good town site. Land speculators by the name of Henry Morris, James Caldwell showed up and uh, uh, Henry Morris bought his land from Sarah Seal. Uh, Congress passed an act, I don't know, have the year on that, but they, it was military bounty land. And eligible veterans, as in the Seal family, uh, Mr. Seal fought in the 1812 war, so they were given bounty land once uh, Wright County was surveyed. So Morris had to make a deal with Sarah Seal to buy the land that's, uh, as you can see, squared in with the black. On the right is James Caldwell. He uh, staked that land out, but he never did uh, uh, make any effort to uh, claim it. He just sat on it. Uh, Morris had to buy that land. It cost him $1.25 an acre. This was long before the Homestead Act, which came in 1862. And these guys showed up uh, about 1858. Um, they uh, called their town site Waverly after their former hometown in Waverly, New York. And they recognized the water potential, so they started building a dam and a sawmill in 1858, and it was completed in April 1859. They had contracted with Thomas Morton, the mechanic and millwright, for $2,500 to build the dam and have the sawmill operable, which he did make it by April, yeah, but they never paid him. So Mr. Morton filed a lien over in Monticello, because that was the county seat at the time, on November 4th, 1859. But as it turned out, he was given the wrong legal description uh, of the parcel that uh, was distant from the sawmill. So going through uh, the records at the recorder's office, we found that uh, the lien was never renewed or satisfied. With the lien, it's against the property, and if they go to sell it, they can't get a clear title until that lien is somehow satisfied. And you have to renew uh, liens periodically. It was never renewed, but going over to 
legal description, we figured out he got beat. He got the wrong legal description. <laughs> and now on Google Earth, we can uh, see uh, where the dam was built right there, mainly because the banks were fairly close together, it would take less material to build the dam, and then everything out in here would be the reservoir which would power the mill through uh, dry periods. But due to financial problems, Henry Morris sold his land and mill site, which was later purchased by A.D. Kingsley, who proceeded to make more improvements, added a flour mill, and uh, there weren't enough people in the area to uh, generate a lot of business, so Kingsley sold to Charles Bonnewell in 1874 for $5,300. It was during Bonnewell's ownership that he started to have fairly successful business, and uh, in 1882, the mill burned down, he rebuilt and kept uh, operating the mill till about the late 1880s, early 1890s, he just abandoned it because he had built a new mill in Howard Lake. So the dam would have been between the Stone Arch Bridge where Frank Paris House sits now? Yep, right, okay. by the most narrow part. Okay. Uh, uh, Pioneer Waverly Governance. Uh, Wright County was formed in February 1855. Buffalo and Woodland Townships uh, each had a half of Marysville Township. Woodland on the south and probably the Pearl River was the boundary line. Marysville Township itself was organized in May 14, 1865. So if you do any uh, census records of people living like 1860 in that area, they're going to be listed as uh, Woodland Township, not Marysville. Pioneer Waverly never officially organized or was it ever found any record of a plat. Um, and now, the, here we get into the names of the Waverly Mills and so on, and um, like I say, Caldwell and Morris named it Waverly. But these other names came along from the post office, and it had four, changed four times. Uh, in 1863, Andrew Beck was uh, the postmaster, and at that time the post office allowed the people or the postmaster to name the, the post office after as to how they wanted it. He named it Zellingen, which was after his hometown in Germany. In 1865, Mr. Kingsley changed it to Waverly Mills. And in 1871, it was changed to Waverly Station. By this time, the post office was in town. Then in 72, it went back to Waverly Mills. 1889, it just went to plain Waverly. And uh, again, these names were postal designations. Uh, the railroad plat, the town of Waverly. This, uh, first of all, the railroad was first proposed in 1857. We found this drawing showing uh, the proposed rail line. Notice how close it goes to the lake, kind of out by the cemetery and then down across the south end of the upper lake and then on west. Uh, Later, before, well, when they started to build the roadbed, they moved the line kind of uh, where it is today, off there, and then in a straight line down that way because it allowed less terrain correction. They could have a much straighter and flatter route. This is the original town site map submitted to Wright County, November 12, uh, 1869 the town of Waverly. And again, if you notice on the top of the map, it's the town of Waverly. And uh, in the writing on the side is by the surveyor and uh, railroad executives. And the one on the bottom left over there is by the county recorder. By this time, that was over in Buffalo. And that was the St. Paul and Pacific Railroad because uh, 
the previous railroad in the Minnesota and Pacific went bankrupt. Waverly was the first village planted, planted by the railroad on its trek westward. And note today that, uh, well, I don't know if you can see it, but the street names are the same today as when the railroad was uh, uh, platted it out. There are never been changed. So did the, did the railroad own the land? That was their land. They owned land. See, they were giving, uh, the, off the proposed line, they were given six miles either side, but every other town uh, section, it had to be odd number section, Waverly's in section 33, so that was their land. And uh, the only town between Waverly and Minneapolis at the time was Delano, and at that time it was called Pearl River. Delano comes from a railroad executive. When I think the town incorporated, they changed it to Delano. If I can make one comment, it's kind of hard to read, but in the, on the, the paragraph on the right-hand side, the upper paragraph, it's the owners of the railroad giving all, uh, hereby give the avenue streets and alleyways as shown for public use. So that... So do people have to buy it from the railroad? Yes. Or they're just giving... No, they have to As far as the streets and the alleyways, that for public space, that was given. But other than that, yeah, you had to buy... You bought your lots from the railroad. <laughs> When we took, this was 10, 15 years ago, we took on a, a quarry that was in the railroad park right now. We found out that was on 30 days. We bought that land from the railroad. The city bought it from the railroad. Yeah. Yeah, that would be, is that show block 22. In 1881, uh, Waverly Incorporated, prior to that, uh, their business was conducted through Marysville Township. And as the town was starting to grow, uh, they had their own needs that was beyond the scope of the township government. And this is the original copy of uh, the paperwork for incorporation. William Quinn, L.V. Kite, J.K. Cullen, as I mentioned J.K. Cullen before, John Giblin, C.H. Cullen, who was the son of J.K. Cullen, and John O'Gorman were the first officers. The first matter of importance to the village was sidewalks in front of the businesses and fire protection. As you can see, we've got smoking remains there. The one on the left is Giblin's store that burned in 1912. The bottom, or the right side, the top one is the old uh, city village hall which was built in 1893, and the bottom one is when it burned in 1938. Lightning struck it, and the fire was far ahead of what they could, they could fight. And it was also their fire station, too, that they lost. Do you know when the Catholic Church was built? Yeah, and I think Cornerstone is 1892. Uh, on April 22, 1886, the fire department was adopted as legal fire department of the village of Waverly. The fire department formation of 1886, we have the roster and officers and members. You look at those names, very few are familiar to anybody today. Most everybody, is, the families have long since moved on. Fire protection prior to 1905, or even before this was set up, the fire department was set up, was uh, everybody had a private well and the village had buckets. So it was the old proverbial bucket brigade, and that's how they fought fires. Uh, right after 1900, the village saw the need for a pressurized water system. They voted on it in 1903, it went down, but in 1905 it, it passed. And uh, the system was a pretty good size system. They used compressed air to move the water, which is much the same today as people that have their own wells. They have a pressure tank, it's air that moves the water through the lines. The water tank had a 12,000 gallon capacity, 
and they bought a Waterus gasoline engine, a 30 horse. Waterus is a company of St. Paul, it's still in business, and I think one of the original fire hydrants is still, still in use yet. Uh, they're capable of pumping 300 gallons a minute. They had a Curtis air compressor to supply the air. The estimated daily consumption was 4,000 gallons of water, and they replenished the water tank and air reservoir in the morning and the evening. It had an 8-inch intake, which went 300 feet out in the lake, 3 feet below the surface. They estimated the domestic pressure to be 100 pounds, but it ended up being less than that, roughly about 70 pounds. They laid out 2,000 feet of 6-inch mains, 2,800 feet of 4-inch mains, and they had 13 double hydrants laid by 1907. The water supply between 1886 and this was hydrant, or, uh, cisterns. And the cisterns held roughly about 5,700 gallons at a well by each cistern. They had three of them. And uh, uh, they uh, put together their own pumper and they'd draw out of those cisterns and they couldn't reach the whole community. It was just mainly the businesses uptown that was covered by the fire protection. The one thing they started doing after about 1903, even though the water bill had failed, they knew they had to start correcting the terrain, get the streets down level. And uh, we had looked through the council books and thought maybe they hired a contractor to do this, and we found out they didn't. They bought equipment, and we weren't able to find any inventory, but it was equipment much like this, all horse-drawn, that they used to level a lot of the streets. And some places dig them down, like in front of the Catholic Church. If you look, that's a cut through there. And that was to get Elm to kind of line up with Maple. And um, what they did is they hired farmers, especially in the fall after crops were taken out. They hired the farmers and a team of horses and paid them by the hour. The next thing is there was a massive amount of dirt that was moved. And where did all the dirt go? Because uh, uh, Maple Street, or that street, the houses on the south side are quite a bit higher than the ones on the north. And uh, when they plotted that out, that shows uh, lots in there, but that uh, eventually they used that dirt later. But Maple, and here there's, they worked their way back, and here, and here, and you can, you can see that today. Uh, and you look on this map, this is from the original plat. There's no ballpark, but uh, just that spit of land out there. So when they started moving dirt, they started hauling it down in this, this area here and started building the ballpark. Oh, another thing is, notice Lake Avenue today goes straight through, but it doesn't. What had happened in 1901, the lake was lowered by six feet maybe eight feet, we really don't know for sure, but landowners on the north side wanted to uh, gain a little more property. So uh, where the channel is today, there was an embankment across there and they dug into that to drop the lake down. And uh, when we were doing the research, we'd find passages where the lake used to be much bigger or there's a group of guys trying to lower the lake, yeah, but there was nothing definitive any place. So just by reading the old maps and looking at uh, the 1879 map, look how the bay is shaped on the north side. And there the spit of land shows up very clearly. This 1902 map shows the lake drawn down. Look how the bay has changed. And there's a spit of land, but look at the land that was exposed after they drew it down. So in 1903, and years going on for the next few years, they started moving dirt off the streets to start building the ballpark. And I showed you earlier on uh, Lake not going through, there was a bank in there, and they 
you can look today they cut that way back to even add more dirt down into the to the ballpark to make it pretty much the size it is today public utilities the first viable telephone company was 1904 the Wright County Telephone Company was the first successful business to offer phone service. Attempts began in 1897, but it was erratic, and in 1904, it, it became a viable business. Water, the pressurized system, started working in 1905. That water system, um, where, was, where did it enter the lake? Where was the pump? Oh. Right down there. Is that the right, one you were talking about? Right in there. there. See, when the lake got lowered, the old pump house actually stood where there used to be a lake. Mm -hmm. What became of the old pump house? It sold there? Tore it down. Really gone. I remember being down as a kid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, I can't tell you when exactly they tore it down. It was sometime, I think, in the 70s. Yeah. It was down there just kind of by itself, so nobody. Kind of, kind of down below the river, down below it. Yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, Waverly was one of the later towns that have electricity. A lot of towns were 1890s, early 1900s. Waverly got it in 1914 by a light and power company of St. Cloud, Minnesota. We tried to ch see if they morphed into Northern States Power, but we were unable to find that. Sanitary sewer, 1926. And the one statement says there are goodbye cesspools. That was a was a chronic problem. There were a lot of complaints about that. And uh, where did that go? Went into the bay on the east end. Intake over here. Yes. Yeah. And if you notice the point that exists today of the bay there, that's man-made. We tried to find a reason for that. The only thing we can come up with, they put that in as a barrier, as a buffer for the sewage. And we check with the DNR, and they have no records that go back that far. And you know, and there's nothing mentioned in any council minutes. No, nope, nothing. Because well, everyone knew what was going on. Why would you need to write in the minutes? <laughs> and, all, and, all, and if you remember all the fish houses out there in the wintertime, <laughs> while that sewer was being pumped right in. Oh, boy. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> That's why everybody was healthy. That could be. There was a tank, yeah, right up on the corner of Maple and County Road 9. It's kind of a, like a... There's still a tank there. A pumping station. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that fly today? <laughs> uh, the upper left is the Village Hall, and that's actually the third one. They had two prior to that. And... Uh, the one on the upper right is the conceptual drawing of the new one after the other one burned. And the bottom two are pictures of buildings that stood where, the, where that building is standing today. That one was McDonald's, actually built by J.K. Cullen, his son-in-law, uh, I can't think of his first name, ran the business there. And that building burned in 1916. Yeah, but there was a little structure moved in afterwards, uh, what its purpose was, we never did find. And then this is Quinn implement, this is the famous 1914 manure spreader parade by International Harvester. And uh, their buildings were still standing, but they were vacant by this time. And they were bought and tore down to make room for the village hall. Here we're looking at a lumber yard started by Quinn's that used to be in the park. There's Quinn's. This would be McDonald's. This is Giblin's store, which burned. Uh, that stands today. That was Giblin's warehouse. And there's the, the old village hall that burned. <coughs> and another view of Quinn's building. 
And this was Joe Jolliker's uh, saloon. And I think that one also burned. Uh, this picture, White Eagle Oil Company, was uh, right on the corner, the same lot as Quinn's, but it was on the northwest corner. Johnson's Garage is there. Ken Coons has a body shop there. And this is uh, taken from the construction side of the new city hall. These two buildings are on Elm, just the other side of Doc Mall's old building. Uh, that was built by D.W. Flanagan Sr. Used it as a mortuary, and there were other businesses that ran out of there. This was John Holtby's carpenter shop. Here's construction sites, or views of uh, the new village hall. Well, one thing we know here, it wasn't April this year. <laughs> This is what, you know, Franskies or Pete's, as many of us remember. But this was the original building. Not, it was built by William Wozniak in the early 1870s. He sold to Kingstead, who ran it till about 1897. And he sold to John Halepsik in Kingstead, built over where the KC Hall is today. This building burned in 1899. And Lovesick built this structure here. His business was here. Upstairs is rental property. And this was a dry goods store. And then Fransky bought it in the 30s. And as you can see, it had a couple facelifts over the years. Do you get the thread? And it burned. And it burned. And it burned. Yes. <laughs> uh, the Waverly Hotel, one of three. And this one stood where the drugstore used to be. Uh, it was torn down to make room for the drugstore. Phil Hank built the drugstore in the late 20s. Another view of the hotel. And this is looking down Elm to the east. This is about 1930 because the drugstore is there. There's Pete's or Franski's. And the bank building which was originally built in 1900 as a meat market. And uh, uh, the original bank is where the bowling alley stands, and they moved there about 1907. This used to be the hardware store that stood there, and that burnt down about 1950. And the building that's standing there now is the replacement. Looking northwest from what we call Cullen's Elevator, there's the public school, taken down in the early 70s, the rectory, Catholic church, the old Catholic school. And uh, that brick house stands on the corner there yet. I say yet, but it's getting pretty wobbly. Mm -hmm. This uh, had several functions. I don't know just when it was built, but it was quite a while ago. And its last function was a mortuary. Uh, Another hotel, and the brick house up here across from the church is still standing. And then down here, again, we have the church, the school. This was New Wash's hardware store, and it was torn down, escaped fire. Uh, this is the uptown bar, built. That's the second structure there. The original one was wood frame. We weren't able to track down what happened to it. Uh, there's the hotel again. That little house there is moved. It's on the south side of the Catholic Church. Ted Dronick lives there now. There's Pete's. And then this was built by Mr. Dostal. It served many functions, even a mortuary for a short while. And then it became a saloon, and that's the way it stayed until uh, it was torn down. This was uh, Ray's Inn, and then its last purpose was Humphrey's Museum. It burned in the 90s. Uh, this was a dry goods store. It burned early 1900s. Um, this is the store built by Mr. Kingstead in the late 1890s, and it was a grocery store for many years. Campions had it. McDonald's were the last ones to have a grocery store. And uh, it 
It was torn down to make room for the KC Hall. This structure was moved over at McDonald's old site where his store burned. Um, this became a residence and then what became the fire hall after the fire in 38 and then there used to be a printing shop. Well, actually, uh, another one of the old grocery store. Like I say, this was a residence, fire hall, and what used to be part of the old printing shop. The printing shop moved many places through the years in Waverly. Elm Avenue, or Main Street it was called, looking east. Uh, this is Walsh's building. That's the second building. His first one was two-story. He lived upstairs. That burned. This is the original bank. This was by J.K. Cullen. It served as an office for him. And he did some real, uh, real estate, sold insurance, and eventually served other functions, a restaurant, uh, bar, and it was torn down. And that would be, uh, was originally Tom Perry's blacksmith shop. When he retired, shortly thereafter, it became the first theater in Waverly. No, this one. And uh, that was a grocery store that, that was tore down. Pete's, and down on the end, uh, I believe it's the drugstore. Another view looking east. And Berkner's Mill, that was built in the early 1890s. I mean, that was steam powered for many years, then in 1927. They installed that Fairbanks Morse single cylinder diesel engine. It had a 14 inch bore. How was uh, Tom Perry related to Eddie Sue? Uh, grandfather. Okay. And those of, those of us old enough remember the steady thump of that engine all day, six days a week, start seven in the morning, work till five, six every evening. And earlier years when they were doing flour, that thing went 24 hours a day. And it was quite a process to start that. Another view of the old mill, it burned March uh, 1965. Was it still operational? They were still running the feed mill. They weren't doing flour anymore, but it was still... With the same diesel or a different... No, that, they replaced it with electricity, I think, in 62, because Phil Zeller, the engineer retired. And like I say, it was kind of a trick to start that thing. Phil showed us, but you know, we were only about that big. It was quite fascinating. Do you think Waverly is the most flammable town in the United Kingdom? <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> or the most arson ridden? <laughs> We've had that mentioned before. Right? Yes. Hmm. But you can see why, why to the general public, water, water system was very important. You know, we can get by, we've got our lamps, we don't need lights, electric lights, but by golly, we need, you know, mm. fire protection. So where was that mill located? I'm sorry, I missed that. Oh, be on the uh, north side of Maple. Uh, so it's just over Lake Street? Is that right? uh, between Something? Lake Street and Maple, and uh, a little bit to the right or east of 3rd. Okay. Now the creameries... Uh, the first creamery was built 1897, I think it is, and uh, built on the very east side of the bank parking lot, right along the road there. And then in 1917, as dairy was starting to really take off, uh, they needed a bigger facility, so that building was built, and it ran till mid to late 40s and went out of business like so many other creameries in the area. Just didn't survive. The elevators. Now you think about Waverly, it was quite a town at one time. Three elevators, two banks, three hotels. We have a bank. That's all that sifted through the sands of time. The Cargill elevator well, actually, I should start with uh, Quinn's, which is this one. It originally was on the north side of the tracks. 
a very small structure and it didn't take long. They needed something bigger. So this one was built uh, in 1876. And Quinn Brothers bought it. We weren't able to find out who, but they had it for a number of years. And then they it went through different owners. The last one to have it was Powers Elevator Company, and it quit functioning in 1930. Farmer's Elevator, as we knew as Cullen's, was uh, built in 1880 by C.A. Patterson. Patterson operated a few years and then uh, uh, sold it to M&D. M&D had it, and in 1898 it, uh, it had a fire. <laughs> <laughs> Promptly rebuilt, it was called Farmer's Elevator, operated under that name for a number of years, then uh, the Cullen family bought it in the mid-20s and ran it till about the mid-70s, late 70s, and early 80s it was tore down. Cargill uh, came along in um, 1887, and pretty much one man ran it, C.H. Learned, and uh, it ceased to function in 1927. These two elevators were originally powered by steam, they had an engine house about 50 feet away and they ran it by belt to power the elevator because of the uh, grain dust, the volatility of it. And by the late 1890s, they started converting to gasoline engines. This one was a little different. This one was run by a horse that walked in a circle. <laughs> it was miter gears that run a tumbling rod to the elevator to power it. And uh, you didn't always need power so the horse could rest. What Quinn's found is if you had a blind horse, it worked better because the horse would never get bored. <laughs> in 1899, Quinn's put in a gasoline engine. And the horse that was running the elevator, his name was Blink. And the kids in the area tried to find a home for Blink. And one of them was our old, where we live, J.K. Cullen. They took Blink out there and uh, hitched him to another horse to work a plow, and it wasn't satisfactory, so they continued on finding a home for Blink. And they did, somebody north of town took him, and he lived out his remainder years without working, a nice pasture and a nice barn. <laughs> as long as you've got it there yet, um, why don't you show, like, with the houses, the three houses, they're still existing in Waverly. Um, that one's uh, wait, still... Yeah, yeah go, go through them as long as it's a pretty yeah. nice picture. There's two of those still standing. Uh, that house is standing. That used to be Marty Mays. No, that one is. This, Quinn's built, I'm not sure what year, but in 1881, the village bought this from Quinn's, and uh, that was our first village hall. And that was tore down in the 40s. The house that's standing there was brought to, uh, was moved to town by my grandpa Pete Glossom. Uh, so this is looking northeast or southeast? Southeast. When it says Warwick Lake, that's that's, that's out. Yeah. That's where the subdivision is. It's out. You know, you go east on 12, mm -hmm. and it's on the the right on the south side of the road. That was one of the names that it was called. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is called now. Kerrigan. Kerrigan, okay. This, this was a postcard that my dad had, and uh, he was always very proud of it because he liked the picture of the three elevators. Being born in 1960, he, he remembered all that. But I didn't know enough what questions to ask. Too bad. So with that, that concludes our presentation. Any more questions?